Good morning. I, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a preview of sort of what's coming up um, in the next little bit. Uh, so we, we're in the Advent season, which means, um, you know, we're, we're singing and talking about uh, these different themes of Christmas. Uh, last week was about hope, and today we're talking about peace. Next week will be about joy, and then Christmas Eve, uh, which will be a, a special service. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's only once every seven years we get a Christmas Eve on, uh, on a Sunday. So we're having our Sunday service uh, open to the community. It'll be a little different, a little different format, and uh, we're going to be looking at the topic of love. And, and then the following, the following Sunday is New Year's Eve. So, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a, it's a unique day to have a church service. And uh, I, want to, I want to uh, focus on the idea of prayer. And just to sort of start the year with that, I, with that on our minds of, of prayer. And I appreciate, uh, Greg, how you, uh, when you pray you know, when you do this each time you lead, uh, you have prescribed prayers, you have written prayers. And it's something I'll talk about on the 31st, and, you know, this, this idea of using prescribed prayers, prayers that are written by other people. And uh, I'm a big fan of that. I, I quite like that. It's not the only way to pray. Uh, we should always bring our, our hearts to God in sincerity. And, uh, but sometimes we can't. Sometimes we just don't have the words. And so we need other people's words. And it's a good practice to, to use uh, words written by people who have gone before us, who have faithfully uh, you know, loved and served the Lord, and they have written things down for us to benefit from. That's what the book of Psalms is all, all about. Uh, they're, they're prayers for the church, for God's people. Uh, so those are th- things we can look forward to. And then in the new year, uh, January 7th and 14th, we'll, I'll be away. And so we have, on the 7th, we have... Uh, well, I don't remember the order. I think Tamara first, and then Elliot on the 14th are going to be preaching. So you can look forward to hearing from them uh, in, in about a month. So let's, uh, let me just pray as we get into the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you, are, you are our source of peace. You are our source of hope and joy and love as we think about these themes at Christmas time. Uh, They're not just good words and things to think about, but they are a reality for those of us who trust in you. And so I pray for each one of us this morning as we uh, ponder what it means for you to be the Prince of Peace in our lives, that you would transform us with these words, that you would uh, make us into people of peace, people who experience and bring peace in a way that is foreign to the world, uh, but brings light to everywhere we go. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you think about the state of the world currently, would you describe it using the word peace? Anyone? Would anyone dare? (laughs) It really isn't, and it never has been. The world has never really truly been at peace. And, you know, if, if there's no war going on, which has been actually very... Uh, I, I've looked at the number of years in, in recorded history, the number of years that the world has been without an official war happening, and it's a very small number. But even in those uh, few years where there's no war happening there is a lack of peace for a variety of reasons. What about your life? What about in your home or in your workplace or in your community? Is it a peaceful place? Would you consider yourself a person of peace? Do you bring peace to the places where you have influence? What about the places outside your home where maybe you, in in moments where you at least suspect you to be ready to bring peace. I think about the grocery store lineups. <laughs> Are you a person of peace when you're standing in a line? I wrote uh, two questions at the top of the outline, if you have it in front of you. If you don't, that's okay. But these two questions we'll come back to, 
a few times. The first question is, how have you experienced peace this week? And what might prevent you from experience, experiencing peace in the coming week? So how have you experienced peace this week? It's a reflective question. And then a question of anticipation is, what might prevent you from experiencing peace in the coming week? I believe that God is concerned about these things. He's concerned about us being peaceful, experiencing peace. He is a God of peace. And as we'll see, the deliverance of people into the experience of peace was a primary objective in Jesus' coming, of him sacrificing himself and resurrecting into new life. This new life that he resurrected into is a life of peace. And we are invited to join Jesus in that experience. So, what is peace? It's, a, it's actually a really important question, even though many of us probably have a ready answer. In the Bible, peace describes the ideal human state. That's really what it's all about. It's more than just an absence of conflict. It's wholeness. Not just the inv individual, but the community and relationships that we experience. Peace, full peace, is when everything is as it should be. It is total well-being, prosperity, security. And in the Bible, among God's people, it was associated with God's presence among them. So in the Old Testament, the presence of peace signified God's blessing in the covenant relationship between himself and the nation of Israel. This is the, the Hebrew word shalom that you might have heard before. It just means that everything in that relationship between God and people is as it should be. It didn't happen very often. The Israelites failed, and so peace wasn't there. The absence of peace signified the breakdown in that relationship due to Israel's un, uh, disobedience and unrighteousness. And in the New Testament, the word peace, it's, it's a, a Greek word, irene, it was a common word. In the Greek culture, it was just a way to greet people, peace be with you. It wasn't a, there wasn't any sort of uh, attachment to, uh, you know, Christianity. It, it existed before Christianity existed, that, that word. And it wasn't really tied to necessarily a spiritual thing. It could have if someone was, you know, a spiritual person. But it was just a common greeting. You know, it's like us saying, how was your day? Or how are you doing? We, we ask that question not necessarily expecting a full-fledged answer. It's a way we greet people. And in, in, in the kind of the Roman world, in, in Greek, people would say, peace, peace be with you. Uh, but when... Christi when Jesus used that word and when Christians used that word, it, it had a deeper meaning. They took that kind of secular word and that idea and they turned it into a blessing that really was used in the Old Testament as well. It was a blessing of wholeness. So it was a blessing also of rest. That when someone said, uh, peace in the name of Christ, it was meant to invoke that idea of shalom that through Christ you will experience wholeness and rest. So in John 14, 27, Jesus told his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus was, was using this term, a common term, and he was saying, I give you this idea of wholeness and rest in a way that the world does not. And what he was likely thinking about in, in, in the time of the early church, they were under Roman rule, and there was this idea that you may have heard of called Pax Romana. And pa Pax is the word for peace. It's, it's this idea that, that under the Roman rule, there was peace in, in the world because they, they ruled with an iron fist. If you were trying to raise up an insurrection against the government or against the the empire, then they would, uh, they would punish heavily. And, um, you know, among the lesser in the society, they would just kill them. And then among the higher in society, they would punish them 
greatly. I read about, uh, it, there was an article about how we should maybe th think about adopting Romans' way of bringing peace, ancient Rome's way of bringing peace. And, and so when, you know, if you think about the January 6 uh, events at the, at the White House in Washington, there were actually articles written about that event saying, if we were the Roman Empire, here's what we would do. And uh, among people who brought about insurrection, uh, because the, the Greeks would sort of, when they, they were known for, when they were preaching or, or when they were speaking publicly, they would use their, their index finger and their thumb to make a point and like kind of bring an emphasis to something. And so they would actually cut off the index finger and the thumb of someone who was speaking insurrection, rising up people against the government. And that's how they would punish the more kind of affluent people, but the, the slaves and the, and the lower people were just killed. And that's how they kept the peace. So Pax Romana, that's the way the world brings peace, by punishment. But that's not the way that Jesus brings peace. Peace in, in God's eyes is a desirable state of being. I don't know about you, but that way of bringing peace, the way the Romans did, is not a desirable way of experiencing peace. It's a way of maybe preventing conflict, but it is certainly not peace. When we talk about peace, that's what we often think about. The minim we, we minimize it to think about the absence of conflict. And so we use terms like keep the peace. We, we want to get along. We believe that getting along means that there is peace among us. Or we might think of a peaceful environment as a place that is quiet and calm. Or after a long bout of conflict between adversaries, when the fighting stops, we might consider that to be a time of peace. But these definitions are about a particular environment. In order to experience that sort of peace, we need the environment to be a certain way. We need there to be no conflict. We need it to be calm. We need the absence of, of noise and danger. And while these are elements of peace, they are signs of peace, possibly, peace in God's eyes is so much more than that. See, in the way that the world brings peace, it's a result of things being a certain, a certain way. But as we'll discover, when you experience the peace offered by God through Christ, it'll be something that carries you, that actually brings transformation. So rather than peace being a product of your environment, it will transform your environment. This idea, it's the idea of being at rest, not because the circumstances are conducive for rest, but because the presence of Jesus is with us. In Philippians 4, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's a, the peace that comes through Christ doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's not, we can't comprehend it. Because the way that the world brings peace is so different. It's amazing when, when you see, you know, I think some of us as we, you know, of, of my variety maybe, not, maybe not all of you, but as, as we get more tired, we seem to be able to fall asleep in just about any situation. Like, Believe it or not, some people actually fall asleep during a sermon. <laughs> Blows my mind. I don't know how that's possible, but that's sort, of the, that's sort of what we're talking about. Like, there's this sense of rest that can happen, even though there's a captivating and dynamic speaker in front of you. <laughs> that's the peace of God that allows you to rest in the midst of activity all around you. And so your circumstances then will become bearable because God's peace is with you. So think about the questions at the beginning. How have you experienced peace this week? How, what might prevent you from experiencing peace in the coming week? And, and rephrase it with this understanding of, of peace. So 
How have you received God's gift of wholeness and rest this week? And what might prevent you from receiving God's gift of wholeness and rest this coming week? So keep thinking about that, those questions and we'll come back again at the end. So that's what peace is, wholeness and rest, despite the circumstances. In fact, it will transform circumstances. So how does Jesus bring peace? How is this possible? As I read earlier from John 14, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Human efforts to bring peace inevitably lead to more conflict. It leads to oppression and destruction because we can't agree as a human race on the right means to peace. Some people want to do it through an iron fist. Some people want to do it through charity or through uh, some sort of, you know, hum, like human kind of well-being. If we all just, if there were no poor among us, we would have peace. Or, you know, if everyone had everything they needed, there would be peace. But our sin gets in the way. We become selfish. We become greedy. We don't like the way someone else is bringing peace. And so then we rebel against them. No matter what, as long as sinful humans are in power, regardless of how Christian the government is, there will be conflict because there will be disagreement, defiance, and rebellion. This will always exist. And so the way of peace for Jesus is not by a brutal squashing of all defiance or through coercion, but through transparent vulnerability. This is how he brings peace. Transparent vulnerability makes defiance against Jesus pointless. Jesus said, here I am, (laughs) to the enemy. He said, here I am. And the enemy killed him. That That didn't end anything. In fact, it brought new life. So any attempt to defy Christ is pointless. The only defiance or threat that we should be concerned about in the church is our own defiance that claims that I can get peace my own way, that I can set it up on my own terms. If I just set everything up just right in my life, then I will have peace. That is the only thing we need to be concerned about. Self-reliance has always been the greatest enemy of relationship with God. See, it's not the way of Jesus to try and muster up and produce peace through some sort of coercive way. His way seems backwards. Have you ever seen a politician stand up and vulnerably sacrifice themselves for the better of society? It, they don't, not just because they're, they're bad people. I mean, there's lots of politicians that are good people because it doesn't work. In our human systems, it doesn't work. It always fails because someone will take advantage. And so the whole system crumbles. That's why systems don't work. It's individual work and church life and community and constant everyday behavior that really matters. Not power systems. Not not by ruling in a certain way. Because we will fail. Only Christ can rule with complete peace. And until he comes, we are to model what his peace really looks like, which is vulnerability, sacrifice. It's submitting, through, submitting to death and resurrecting to new life that brings peace. It's the peace that brings about reconciliation, and this is really what it comes down to. Because until we are fully reconciled to God, there will always be conflict. The primary source of conflict is our disconnection with God. Without his wisdom, without him leading us, we will, we will fight among each other. Even, even with him among us, we'll fight among each other. Isaiah 53 speaks about the Messiah. It's a, a prophecy that many of us are familiar with. You've, you've heard these words before. It says... 
Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the immoral behavior of us all. Isaiah is assuming that all of us will behave wrongly. But even so, we can have peace because Christ took the punishment for our wrongdoing. And so we have peace with God. And so we cannot wait until all is right until we've done all that is required of us, peace doesn't come that way. If you're trying to set your life up in a perfect way so that you will have perfect peace, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it will fail. Because the place where peace is, is least present is in our own hearts and in our, our own souls, in our own beings. If we, are, if we are trying to set up our external environment so perfectly so that we will have peace, it will still fail because the, the, the greatest source of lack of peace is inside of us. See, we cannot produce the peace that Christ offers. We have to receive it. It's a gift. Now, this uh, Christmas season, you know, I talked last week about anticipation. It's a, a season of anticipation, a season of waiting. And we usually think about Christmas as waiting for the arrival of Christ, you know, Christmas Day and, and uh, you know, Jesus in the manger and, and the whole nativity scene. Beautiful stuff, and I love it, and I never want to get rid of it. But it's a season of anticipation for another reason. I actually want to bring us to the night before Jesus was crucified. That was a night of anticipation. If you have a, a Bible, um, I'd, I'd like you to, to look at this passage. It's John 13. And uh, we'll put it up on the screen as well. I don't often do this because I think it's okay to just listen. But in this case, I want you to see the words that I'm going to read here. This is a, a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. This is uh, uh, the night before he was crucified. It was the night he was betrayed and handed over to the Romans to face crucifixion. And he's sitting down with his disciples for, uh, to prepare for Passover, and he was sharing in the Passover meal with them. And, uh, and this is what he said, or this is the, the telling of it. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. Okay, so what does this have to do with peace and Christmas and, and stuff? It's It's... It takes a lot of imagination. <laughs> and uh, as I was preparing this and I was thinking about it, it actually, it actually struck me in a new way. So I decided to keep it and hopefully you can track with me. So notice what prompted Jesus to wash the feet of the disciples. This is in verse 3. So verse 3 is up there. Perfect. I can trust that monitor, can't I? <laughs> up there. That's, I can hardly read it. But... Uh, so verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knew what was about to happen. The betrayal of Judas, the abandonment of his closest followers and friends, his death by crucifixion, and worst of all, the experience of being forsaken by God as he took on the sins of the world. 
He knew what was coming. This, he was anticipating this terrible, terrible day. His environment was worse than any of us could imagine. But he knew that this would not end in separation from God. He knew it would end in glory, in a renewed body that will live forever. In fact, the way that it would end well, the way that in which his peace would become a reality, was to go all the way through the experience, all the way the experience of betrayal, of his friends abandoning him on the cross, of his father, his heavenly father, forsaking him as he took on the sins of the world. He knew he had to go all the way through that experience. And so we see that the way to peace is death and resurrection. But it's not something we can do. We cannot resurrect ourselves. We can't do what Jesus did. We can't offer ourselves as a sacrifice for our own sins and then be raised back to life. Only Christ can do that because he lived perfectly. He was a perfect sacrifice. And so Jesus did that for us. And because he did that and offered us himself as a sacrifice, we can experience everything that he experienced. On that night, he was betrayed. And through the the crucifixion, the promise held him through it. And so what does he do with this power? It says Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. What does he do with this power and this confidence of resurrection? He washed the disciples' feet. It's, the words there are so important, like the way that it says it. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that he would die, but that he would be resurrected and he would be given new life and he would return to God. Can you go to verse 4? And so, because he knew that, he washed the disciples' feet. This is interesting. He washes their feet. Even Judas, the one who is about to betray him, he was there. He hadn't left yet. His feet were washed by the one he was about to betray. Can you imagine? This is no small act on Jesus' part. This is not just a small detail. Because washing the feet was the job of a slave. I doubt any of those men ever had washed anyone's feet besides their own. That was for people way lower than them. Jesus was demonstrating the way to peace. And we must go in this way. We must walk in this way. He said to disciples, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. The confidence that Jesus had to serve and sacrifice came from a certainty that God had put everything under his power. Because God put everything under his, was going to put everything under his power and resurrect him into new life, he could have confidence to to become the lowest among them and to show them this is the way to peace, sacrificial service to one another. So we can stare our troubles in the face and we can say, the peace of Christ is my rest. The certainty that I will share in the glory of Christ, in the resurrected body with him, That is my rest. And so then I can get down on my knees and I can serve people, even those who want to do me harm, like Judas. Later in John 16, you can take that off the screen. Uh, John 16, he says to his disciples, same evening, this is a long, if you ever want to read, you know, like going through John 12 to 17, it's such, if you don't ever read, uh, large portions of scripture, make that a goal to read that and read it multiple times because this is Jesus and his disciples the day before he was killed. The longest 
conversation in, in, in Scripture. And it's so powerful. And he, uh, later in the evening, he said to his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. See, the experience of peace, uh, having this, this sense of confidence, like we really need it. We need to get it in our heads, in our hearts. It needs to penetrate us. It's, you, it's not just something that, you know, it's an idea you agree with. It really has to bring transformation. And so reading these things and, and understanding them is so important. Jesus challenged us to stop turning toward ourselves as solution. It's Christ who has overcome the world. So Isaiah 9 was, was read earlier, and this is the classic Christmas passage, which I think is just a beautiful uh, prophecy about Jesus. You know, in that, in that reading from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he uh, said that this, this prophet Isaiah, he saw it as though it was a present reality. That's how real it was to him. He spoke in present tense. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. He's saying that the arrival of the Prince of Peace means we're no longer in the dark. Just like Jesus, he knew what was coming. It wasn't good, but he knew it was coming. He could see it. And so the arrival of the Prince of Peace means we can see the trouble all around us. And we can see the way through it. We can have hope. We can have peace. We can, we can have joy. All of these beautiful words. Because Christ himself is our light. He shines the light on our steps. And it's not only his teaching, his miracles, his way of life, it's all of him. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. You can't just have part of him. You can't just have his teaching. You can't just have his miracles. It's all of him. His death and resurrection. His lordship over our entire lives. Every step we take is brought to light by the Prince of Peace, who is the giver of rest. He brings peace through making us into a people with a view toward eternity. A resurrection life that cannot be taken no matter what. So, how do we experience this peace? It's all good to think about it and agree with it and you know, have it in our, in our minds and hearts. But how do we actually experience it in our lives? Some of you are wondering, how do I have this peace? Right now, it seems impossible. And I agree. Many times in life, it seems impossible. I remember being woken up. We had three, three children in three years, 37 months. We had three kids in diapers. And uh, I remember many nights waking up think just totally at a loss. <laughs> Like, how am I going to get through the next day? I'm totally exhausted. And, you know, at that time, I, I really, I wasn't depending on Christ for my peace. It's hard, it's hard to do that, especially when you're tired. You're worn out. But you can cry out to God and ask him. You don't need fancy words. You can ask him. But let me talk a little bit uh, practically. What, how do we experience this peace? So remember, it's not, uh, it's not just the absence of conflict. It's the idea of rest, it's wholeness, not lacking anything. So in any situation, you can be at rest. So we, uh, we experience this peace by understanding that the troubles of this world are temporary. As I was saying, as, as Christ saw what was coming, he knew that though that situation was powerless over him. And this requires a daily turning toward Jesus as our source of peace. So let's go back to John 15. In uh, verse 4 to 7, Jesus said to his disciples, Remain in me. So we're talk remember, we're talking about how do we experience peace. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither you can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So the experience of peace requires reminding ourselves of what is true and staying close to God's instruction and promises, allowing his word to transform us. Remain in Christ. So a couple practical suggestions. First of all, if you currently don't have a Bible reading plan, the, to, you know, today, find one, doesn't matter which one, any, anyone will do. It can be a Bible in a year, two years, five years. It can be, you know, going through certain portions of Scripture. The reason I suggest a Bible reading plan, an actual prescribed, here's what you read each day, is because it prevents you from picking and choosing what you want to read from the Bible. And this is important because the Bible is meant to reshape your thinking, your way of experiencing the world. I can't remember if it was last week, recently, I said, you know, the, the Scripture is not, a, it's not a toolbox where you just pick out, you know, here's the tool that I need for today. It's meant to transform everything about you. And so you need all of it. You need, you need whole sections. And, and it needs to get into you, surround you, and and immerse you in God's truth. And so when we pick out verses, we just get little bits and pieces. It's not, it's not as transformative of reading, as reading whole sections of the Bible. And so I suggest, this is what, what Lynn and I do. We, we read a, the Bible in a year. Right now, we're do, every year we change which plan we use. This year we're doing the one-year Bible. I think New Living Translation is the version we're reading it in. Uh, in, the, in the new year, we're actually going to read the, uh, the message through, uh, which, just to be clear, the message is not uh, a translation in the same way the others have authority. It's a paraphrase. It's one person's interpretation of the Bible. Um, but it is really helpful. I consider it like a commentary. Uh, it's really helpful, and it's really great to go through. There's lots of versions, whatever one you uh, like to read. And, uh, and so we read 15 minutes a day. We actually listen to it usually. And it just, gets in, it just gets in you. You know, the more you listen to it, the more you read it. So I suggest a Bible reading plan as a way to stay close to God, as a way to have him transform all of you from the inside. Another practical suggestion is experiencing the peace of God includes our, our relationships with one another. So I asked at the beginning, are you a person of peace? In our relationships, are we people of peace? Are we offering God's peace to, to one another? So for those who are weak and helpless, you know, those of us who, who visit the shut-in, uh, sick, the, the lonely, people who are desperate for connection and fellowship, um, that's how we bring peace. That's how we make peace in our world is by visiting and caring for them. Psalm 41 says, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. He's talking about the person who cares for the weak. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land, those who care for the weak. He does not give them over to their desires of the, their foes. When we are focusing on caring for one another, suddenly all the, all the nonsense in the world... It just, you ever sit with someone who is, is so at the end of their life, you know, all the nonsense has gone out of their lives. What they, what they truly care about, really listen to that. Listen to, listen to the things that, that truly matter. All of a sudden, all this other stuff, it just goes away. Especially those who have followed the Lord for a long time. Great wisdom. You know, we need, I'm doing a, this is totally a bonus material here. I'm doing a study on uh, Cicely Saunders. She's the founder of the hospice movement. This is for my cl classes in January. Um, she, 
uh, basically the hospice movement is, is caring for the dying, caring for people who are at the end of their life. And she believed that even in the final days of a person's life, they have value. And the value is, it comes in many ways, but one of the interesting things that I'm exploring, and I, I want to understand this greater, is she talked about um, creativity being so vital at the end of a person's life. You know, we, right till our dying breath, we can be creative. We can be uh, people who, who, who love beautiful things. And to hear someone at the end of their life describe the things that they find beautiful, what a, what a blessing. I, I encourage you to try that out sometime. If there's someone in your life who's close to the end of their life, ask them, you know, what are, describe some beautiful things you've seen recently. It'd be interesting. Interesting conversation. The Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. Caring for the dying is a, is a, is a blessed ministry. Romans 12, 70 to 21. This is about relationships with people who maybe we're at odds with. We might even call them enemies. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. It's what Jesus did. He washed Jesus' feet. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is how we bring peace. And this is, this is really hard. I think the church in general, not specifically here, because I haven't been here long enough to say this, but the church, in my experience, and at large, has been far too long a place of judgment. We examine the Bible and we compare it to the way others are living, and we heap condemnation on, it, on them. This is impossible. You can't, this is not the way of Jesus. It's not a way to live. We experience and we share God's peace by loving and seeking to benefit those with whom we find ourselves at odds. We disagree about what kind of singing is in, we're, we're doing in the church. Bless those who disagree with you. The way that I was taught to do that by our pastor in Manitoba is, uh, you know, he would say, oh, yeah, sometimes we sing these songs, and I just, I just can't worship God in that way. I just don't, you know, it's too loud or it's too, you know, whatever. And I, he said, I just have to sit and listen, and I look around, and I see how many others are worshiping God, and I just bless them. I thought, what a, what a great perspective. I can't sing along necessarily this song, but obviously they can, and so I just bless them in their worship. Even those who threaten our well-being. It's not an easy life to love those who want to hurt us. It's not the way of the world. The way of the world is to f defend our rights. The way of the world is to fight for freedom. True freedom happens when we surrender to Christ. That is the only freedom. It is the only peace. And so the peace of Christ is not the result of everything being just right. It is the way that everything is being set right. It is the source of making things right. So instead of waiting for things to be perfect, we bring the transformation with God's peace. Out of our dependence on Christ flows life and light, transforming an environment of struggle, of conflict and pain into an environment of peace. This is the way of Jesus. Would you stand with me? And I want to come back to these questions from the beginning. And we're going to take a moment to pray and ponder in our hearts 
and uh, the worship team will come up and, and lead us in another song. And as we reflect here in this moment, think about these questions again. How have you experienced peace this week, the rest and wholeness of God? What might prevent you from experiencing his peace in the coming week? And as you reflect, think about these questions in a new way. How has the peace of Christ transformed your week? And what might reflect, what might prevent this week? What might prevent the peace of Christ from transforming your circumstances? And I ask it that way as, as, as you kind of think about and pray about this. Um, what might prevent the peace of Christ from transforming your week? Might it be how you're seeking peace? Maybe there's something inside of you that needs to be transformed in order for peace to change your environment, for your home to be more peaceful. So let's pray and, and uh, ask God to to show us this. Lord, we, we admit our, it is so often ourselves that prevents peace. It is so often our own dependence on, on us, on things being just right. When we turn toward anything other than you for peace, it will fail. We may experience temporary calm, a lack of conflict, but the peace that will transcend all understanding comes from you. So Lord, show us as we reflect on these words, show us how we are getting in the way of your peace transforming our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.